Hey folks, you are tuning into Common Groundwater, a podcast by the Michigan Environmental Council. I'm your host, Bill Brockett. Uh, as part of the Common Groundwater podcast, we take you across the state of Michigan to talk about environmental issues. We go deep into the nuance and we try to bring out the storylines and the solutions to those issues in these episodes. You are tuning into the second episode of our Gears in the Sand uh, podcast mini-series or season where we talk about dunes, uh, Michigan's freshwater dunes found along its western coast and in the UP. Uh, this is the second episode of that series. In the first episode, we talked with Tanya Kabbalah of the West Michigan Environmental Action Council about some of the um, political histories, the social histories, the environmental sort of landscape of dunes. Um, and I'm here today with Emily Smith, my coworker at the Environmental <laughs> Council, uh, to get more into some of the policy nuance. We're kind of going to take some of that history and apply it to what's going on today and some of the things that we're trying to work to make happen. So Emily, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, the first time you've been on the podcast. And I think, I don't, I don't think you've, have you been on a, a past webinar of the Environmental Councils? I have not. Okay. Nope. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, <laughs> would you mind introducing yourself? <clears throat> sure. I'm Elise Smith. Um, my title here at MEC is Land and Water Conservation Policy Manager. Uh, which essentially means I advocate at the state capitol on different issues pertaining to Michigan's um, critical resources, which are our lands that we treasure and water that we love. <laughs> love it. And are there um, any sorts of like things that got you into this movement, um, whether through your career or just through your like personal life? I would say both. Okay. Um, I mean, I think personally, Starting out young, I never thought that this could ever be a career. Um, I don't know, just you live in the environment and you never think like, man, I need to protect this. <laughs> it's not something you really think about when you're a child. Yeah. Uh, but um, growing up <laughs> then and you know, figuring out where I wanted to, um, wanted my career to head into, um, I knew that I wanted it to be in law and policy. So mm -hmm. after law school, I started at the Michigan Capitol and then found my way here as policy advocate. There you go. And you were already very familiar with policy nuance <laughs> because of your time at the Capitol too, which I'm sure helped sure. <laughs> get a leg up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as I asked Tanya in her last episode, uh, since we're talking about dunes today and, and as we mentioned in our last episode, um, you know, dunes are very much a part of a lot of Michiganders like experiences, whether they lived by them or visited them. Uh, so I thought I'd ask you, are there any fond memories or stories around a dune that you'd want to share with us? Yeah. So <laughs> I recently learned actually that um, dunes aren't just the big sand hills that we think about. They're much more than that. Um, there's actually four different kinds of dunes and different parts to them, which can include like grasses or trees or even like water, <laughs> not just by the lakeside. Um, so I probably have many more fond memories than I can even think of, but the one thing that comes to mind is probably um, my first visit to Sleeping Bear Dunes. Mm -hmm. um, as an elementary, we uh, we did a, a field trip there. So of course the field trip is always exciting, but the dunes itself, um, especially especially as a child, just running up and down the sand and carefree and at beautiful water and yeah, with your friends. So I think just remembering that and feeling that feeling. Um, is fondness for me. <laughs> yeah, totally. First, I was right with you. I found out kind of just this year how intricate the dunes ecosystem really is. I yeah. thought it was just sand hills too, right. essentially, but it was wetlands and water and forests. Uh, it was very cool to learn. And, and Tanya kind of talked about that too. And um, But I also, my story that I wanted to share was very similar to you, where it was like just being carefree and being a kid on the dunes. Yeah. Mine happened, uh, when I was in college though, some of my cross country teammates, we decided to meet up in Grand Haven for the day. Okay. So we went for a run, we got lunch, and then we like went, I can't remember the name of the dune itself, but we went to some sort of dune mm -hmm. and just 
played there. Like <laughs> you're like, you know, 20 something year olds, but we were just playing in the dunes, you know, like yeah. splashing in the water, wrestling each other, playing Frisbee. And like, I've had moments like that before as an adult, but like, it's always so fun. Like when you have like, when you can just kind of like be a kid again. And so, um, yeah. I agree. I the dunes agree. will do that to you, apparently. <laughs> I think they will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you and I here, you and I are here today to maybe talk about something that may not seem as fun on, <laughs> as splashing in the water, but yeah. super important. Yeah. Uh, and I think it is a pretty exciting. Um, there's some big efforts underway to, um, make our, the laws around our dunes better suited, not only for the ecosystems themselves, but also for the communities that want to like live nearby. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, you and I attended or kind of set up a press conference <laughs> around this yeah. and we brought in some reporters and an advocates uh, and uh, heard from two West Coast lawmakers about some legislation. Could you give us like a, re a really quick overview as to like who these lawmakers were and the sort of legislation that they were proposing to put into place? Yeah, um, we have, yes, two bills. Um, that we're hoping to introduce. They're still being drafted right now um, and getting input by administrators and from stakeholders and from other legislators even. Um, but first, uh, we're looking to restore protections that were lost in the Critical Dunes Protections Act. Um, it, was essentially gutted back in 2012. Um, mm -hmm. And we're looking to, um, you know, restore those lost protections uh, and make sure that developers who want to uh, build in our dunes, whether in the critical dunes or just on the lakeshore dunes themselves, um, are doing so smartly. Mm -hmm. And so we need a better guidance for them. Um, I feel like the um, when they were gutted back in 2012, we're seeing a lot of unsound and unsafe um, building practices within the dunes, um, which is causing um, unstable dune environments, but mm -hmm. also unstable uh, buildings and development. And so we just want to make sure that we're, um, we're protecting our dunes for generations to come, but also that we're, you know, protecting the, the buildings that we want to be there within the dunes. <laughs> yeah. And the thought behind that is because dunes are Kind of moving ecosystems they travel over time mm -hmm. uh, and so they're very very touchy when it comes to what's being built on them and so the thought is is that correct like that's the thought process behind these is we need to build uh, a system in place in michigan that is better attuned to that sort of movement of dunes so dunes can still be healthy yeah. but then also so buildings aren't being covered by sand or, right or yeah i mean <laughs> we have a whole town that was lost to oh. sand um and we don't want that again. So yeah. yeah, Singapore, Michigan, I think it was what it was called. Yes, yeah. yes. They cleared away the trees of the dunes and then the sand came in. Yeah, and actually the Critical Dunes Protection Act um, came shortly after. Um, it was almost completely under sand. Um, mm. the, the act came about in about 1989 and uh, 1970 is when the the town just was completely engulfed <laughs> yeah which is just crazy to think about uh i feel like there's always that story of uh on sleeping bear dunes about some sort of building i can't remember if it was a schoolhouse or something of that nature being covered mm -hmm. but to think of an entire town mm -hmm. is, is a bit mind-boggling it is um you mentioned the critical dunes act and uh just to clarify too, like the, a critical dune is a specific name mm -hmm. or a specific designation for a certain type of dune. So these, this legislation is really focusing in on uh, a certain section of dunes, which are like our most fragile and critical, like our cri most critical ones, so to speak, correct? Yes. Those areas are very specific in what the uh, current law even um, 
regulates. Mm -hmm. um, so when the uh, initial legislation was created to protect our critical dunes, the legislature found, quote, <laughs> um, certain dunes to be a unique, irreplaceable, and fragile resource that provides significant recreational, economic, scientific, geological, scenic, botanical, educational, agricultural, and ecological benefits to the people of Michigan. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So all of that put together is what makes up a critical dune. Okay. And they're um, listed in an atlas, which is updated every now and then um, by Eagle. And, um, you know, as you've mentioned before, dunes are always changing. And so it can always uh, change as well. <laughs> gotcha. And talk about, uh, you know, we were talking about just how important dunes are in a, in a roundabout way of like, you know, for people to play in, for us to relax in, for the environment. Like right. that whole list of what <laughs> constitutes critical dune really just lays everything out there that a dune can provide to us. And the kitchen sink. <laughs> yeah, and the kitchen sink. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we talked a little bit about the general uh, um, kind of status of, of the legislation, where it's at right now, still being mm -hmm. drafted. We talked a little bit about the general uh, effects that this legislation is meant to have. Um, I'd love to spend the latter part of our episode getting into that a little bit more. But first, um, I w just want to make sure we're giving like good attention to like some of the, the general impacts that this legislation is meant to have. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talked about like how our Critical Dunes Act was stripped as being one reason why. Are there any other sorts of things that get you really excited about this legislation because of what they'll do, hopefully? Um, I mean, first and foremost, as an environmental organization, we look to and are excited about <laughs> uh, protecting our environment. Um, but, you know, I think, as I've also kind of mentioned, um, with making sure that we have um, sound development as well. Um, so we're looking to um, make sure they, that we have clear guidelines and um, permitting regulations for developers to know um, where they, they should and should not build within our dunes. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, it seems like a pretty, um, I don't want to say unique bill, but it's, it's interesting in the sense that it's not, it, a lot of it is centered around clarifying things that are already in place in our state. And yes. That little simple act of clarification can have big ramifications and good ramifications for our, our environment and our communities. For sure. Very cool. Well, before we head off to break and then pivot after the break, are there, are there any other things you want to highlight about uh, Dunes ecosystems themselves or generally about this sort of legislation that's being drafted? <laughs> All right. I don't think so. <laughs> Easy enough. Easy enough. Well, great. Uh, in that case, uh, to the folks listening, uh, stay tuned. You'll hear a quick word from our sponsor, Kelsec, and then we'll get right back with you. The Common Groundwater Podcast is brought to you by Kelsec, an international company headquartered in Kalamazoo that provides expertly crafted ingredients that help food and beverages look better, taste better, and last longer all naturally. Calsec has set aggressive goals to send zero waste to landfills by 2030 and to create net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. You can learn more at calsec.com. Hey folks, welcome back to Common Groundwater. You're tuning in to our mini series about dunes. Uh, Emily Smith and I are talking about some proposed policy changes that are being considered in the legislature and that we are, um, we as an uh, organization, the Michigan Environmental Council are advocating um, to see through. Uh, before the break, we talked about how um, these sorts of pieces of legislation came about through the kind of the removal or the, the stripping back of a major piece of uh, law in Michigan. And we talked generally about what these two bills um, will do, which is better clarify the process in which developments, whether they be homes, buildings uh, for businesses, or even mines are approved by governments. 
Um, I'd love to get into some more details about that with you today. And I think sure. it, might, it might first be good to start off by kind of discussing like what a permit is, because that is a, going to be a very big part of what this mm -hmm. proposed legislation um, is all about. Could you describe like what generally speaking is a permit and the process around it? Yeah, so a permit is essentially permission <laughs> to do something, <laughs> um, you know, permitting to do this or that. Um, so in the specific context of dunes, then um, a developer who is seeking to develop in the dunes would have to get permission from the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, which we call EGLE, <laughs> um, which basically means a developer must apply for a permit. Mm. Um, permitting process generally for anything looks like um, an applicant applying for the permit and depending on what they're looking to do, um, they would have to meet and fulfill different criteria within that application process. Um, so one thing about the critical dunes law currently is that it requires EGLE to approve permits um, or grant variances and special exceptions to local ordinances mm -hmm. unless a local unit of government or EGLE can prove why a proposed development would be bad for the dunes, mm -hmm. which is backward in any other permitting process. Um, the burden of proving environmental impact is always on the applicant, mm -hmm. except for now in this case. <laughs> um, and so that's been that way since 2012. Um, so that's one example uh, that we're looking to change. Gotcha. Um, additionally, there's currently no guidance on what evidence or arguments could be used, which has resulted in more permits of unsound developments that remove large amounts of sand and also continued removal of sand um, for like the building maintenance and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're just thinking like building a parking lot <laughs> next to a lakeshore, um, then the blowing sand from nearby dunes is just constantly covering it up. So you have all that constant maintenance. Um, but also if you're building too close to the water, then you have that additional worry of, um, you know, the encroaching water with high water levels or just the natural changes in the lake shore. Um, also the 2012 legislation specifically forbade environmental site assessments and environmental impact statements for a variance to um, a local ordinance, um, which again, kind of goes against um, wanting to protect our environment that um, they're building within. So fractured laws and guidance regarding all of this development within the dunes um, has just created um, unstable like physical environments, but also unstable um, development. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, could you maybe lean in a bit more? Like, in t like I feel like I really have a great yeah. sense of like how um, developments are put in peril because of these laws, which almost seems backwards, right? I'm sure that part <laughs> mm -hmm. of the thought in creating or stripping back some of these laws was we want to make more development happen, but instead we're creating more dangerous development. And sure. what other ways are environments, like the dunes ecosystems themselves, impacted by these stripped back laws and these changes to permits? <laughs> um, when we're looking at the physical landscape, um, dunes in their various makeups, you know, as we previously mentioned, there's, um, four different types of dunes and 
as you said, you know, they can contain uh, wetlands or like grasses and trees and mm -hmm. such. Um, when any of that is impacted, it then impacts the area around it. Um, and so we've learned <laughs> from Singapore, Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, they actually went under the sand because they removed all the trees that were protecting that area. Um, and, and the dunes did dune things <laughs> <laughs> and blew the sand around and uh, covered the town. Um, and so when you have development in these areas, you're, they disturb the, um, the already you know, fragile ecosystems that they are. Um, and you have a lot more maintenance and upkeep that maybe isn't previously thought about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, I'm thinking back to something David Swan who's part of the Saugatuck Dunes Coastal Alliance said uh, to the crowd at the press conference. He didn't say it this way, but I'm gonna slightly rephrase it to say like, he said, um, the changes that we're advocating for aren't just for the environment, they're for mm. the economy, for the communities nearby. And mm -hmm. I feel like what you've, you've talked about these past few minutes really encapsulates that where the, the way Michigan is currently set up, um, the love we have for dunes isn't being <laughs> met in law and yeah. Uh, it's allowed, whether through intention of the developers or not, for us to create some bad developments mm -hmm. in the sense that they're bad for the environment, they, they fracture it, they make it, they affect the, the surrounding area quite a bit, and they affect the people who are working or living in those places because now we have unstable uh, ground, we have, uh, we're close to the water, we're letting mm -hmm. sand blow in. So I just wanted to mention that because I, th I thought what you said really encapsulates that sort of predicament we're currently facing and how new changes can like better benefit both development and ecosystems. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, we can't ignore that um, our critical dunes are literally only found in Michigan. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> they, point, yeah. Yeah, they are nowhere else in the world. Um, the, the specific topography and ecosystems that our critical dunes have are only found in Michigan on, on the West Coast there. Um, so it, it draws in, you know, a lot of tourism and a lot of recreation. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, as you, you mentioned, those, those towns and those people living there, um, it mm -hmm. can greatly affect them if and when, you know, these places are uh, developed. And yeah, yeah. Well, this is a great little uh, way to get into maybe what the legislation that um, the representatives, Reps Hood and Andrews, are proposing or working to propose to the legislature. Um, <clears throat> and maybe we could break it up bill by bill because each one tackles a different thing, kind of, in a way. Sure, yeah. Uh, maybe we can start with Rep Andrews' bill, which focuses on mining. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about what the current situation is like. If their proposed legislation, as it is right now, comes into law, I'll give you a little scenario. If I'm like a miner, <laughs> if I'm a mining company, I should say, not yeah. a miner. If I'm a mining company and um, I'm wanting to like excavate a whole bunch of sand to use it for a subdivision, maybe I want to like set my own little nice little dunes landscape for the subdivision, <laughs> uh, and I seek a permit to be able to do that, mm -hmm. how does how would this new legislation by Rep. Andrews kind of interplay with that? Sure. Uh, first and foremost. Um we would have to ask where the development is occurring. Um, you mentioned a dune. Did you mention, is it in a critical dune though? I, I should say, yeah, it's in a critical dune. <laughs> well, then that's straight up end stop or full stop, no development. Okay. Um, the legislation would say uh, no mining in a critical dune. Okay. Um, but those are you know, there, it's a very small makeup of what the entire dune system is okay. on the West Coast. Um, so maybe they move the, the mine just a few feet over yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're no longer in a critical dune. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the next thing we would have to ask is, is it mining? 
um, is the activity that they're looking to do actually considered mining? Okay. Um, currently, there is no mining allowed for commercial or industrial purposes, um, but those definitions are very murky. Okay. So the bill is looking to um, clarify that. And so the bill would give better guidelines for EGLE to determine what constitutes commercial and industrial purposes. Um, so in your scenario, um, you know, moving sand um, to a residential area, um, even though it's going to a residential area and you wouldn't immediately think like, that's not commercial or industrial purpose. Um, it's likely also not a residential purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so the end result might be no mining allowed. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Whereas uh, if I were like dredge up a whole bunch of sand and I wanted to like send it over to the east side of the state for like road, building a yep. road, that would be like a no-no pretty clearly. Then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Even under current uh, current law. Even under current law. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, and on the flip side, if you want to switch over to the other bill, uh, unless you have other, do we cover anything <laughs> else on the on the mining side? I don't think so. Okay, okay. Uh, flipping over to the uh, to Rep Hood's bill, mm -hmm. she focuses more on uh, the Critical Dunes Act, bringing back some of those protections, which lean more into like building marinas or businesses mm -hmm. or homes mm -hmm. or collections of homes on dunes. How would the new legislation interplay with like that sort of development and permitting process? I guess I could give you a scenario <laughs> too. <laughs> so Sorry. yeah, let me, let's look into the scenario uh, rather than giving a very general statement. So like, let's say I want to, I'm a construction company and I want to build uh, like a little small assembly of like <laughs> tiny houses on the beach because the community you know, dune side communities are usually pretty small. They want more housing. Mm -hmm. uh, so under that new legislation, how does that permit per permitting process change for me? Or how does it, what do I have to do now? Yeah, um, her bill um, is essentially making sure that um, we have responsible development. Um, so here we would want to make sure that the homes are being built responsibly. So, um, the residents who would ultimately live in them, um, can live peaceably, you know, by the beautiful water mm -hmm. <laughs> and not be threatened by either like an encroaching lakefront, um, or sand. Mm -hmm. Um, so even if this might mean choosing a different location for these homes altogether, um, or simply building them you know, further away from the, the Lake Crest, which is essentially the, the shoreline, mm. <laughs> um, the, the bill would give uh, better guidance for, for Eagle to make that dis, uh, determination in the permitting process. Gotcha. So they have a bit more of, I don't know, ammunition's a strong, probably violent <laughs> word, but like they have, they have more, uh, they, they have stuff to back them up, whereas right now they don't have a lot of stuff mm -hmm. in the books in the law to back them up if they want to say hey this development's not safe environmentally i would say so yeah <laughs> gotcha. great uh when we're speaking about this legislation and i know you mentioned it at the top of the episode but it's still being drafted mm -hmm. um do we have a sense of either like when this will be introduced to the full michigan legislature and or what we hope to see happen with it like in the near or longer term future we are hoping for um, sometime in October. Okay. <laughs> so probably near the end of October. Um, and it'll be just an introductory, and it'll just be an introductory uh, phase at that point. Um, and then closer toward the end of November, early December, um, we're going to want some committee action on it. And so that would be my plug <laughs> to um, invite anyone interested in these bills and supporting these bills. Um, you know, talk to your local legislator um, to 
you know, support these bills and make sure that um, we're getting them through this session because we want them, you know, as soon as possible. We've been working on this language for a while. Um, the protections for our dunes is just a long time coming. Um, so any help that we can get would be wonderful. And legislators always love to hear from their constituents. Um, I know sometimes maybe they'll think you're being annoying, but it really does help. <laughs> um, they, they love to hear the personal stories in their districts um, and, you know, even coming out to a committee hearing uh, would be great. <laughs> yeah. Well, and as you mentioned, like you're talking at the start of the episode, right? We have so many stories about dunes ourselves. Yes. It gives great people a great opportunity to, to talk about them. Uh, mm -hmm and then use them for good, yeah. not just a good story. So yeah. um, to folks listening, I will include a link in our podcast description or in some of the, um, like if you got this podcast through social media or through an email, we'll also have some links there for you to access um, that'll help you get better set up to reach out to lawmakers to get involved. So take a look at the link in that description. Uh, well, Emily, this, this feels like a good point where if you're like in a wrap up mode, are there, is there anything else you wanna, you mentioned about dunes or about these bills? I don't think so. Okay, this is great. This makes me feel great as a host. Oh, I'm good. covering all our bases then. Yeah. Okay. Well, Emily, thanks so much. Really appreciate you taking the time today to talk. Uh, it means a lot, and I'm, I really am excited to see some traction happening about around these bills. So. Me too. I think that's why I'm speechless. I'm just so excited <laughs> to get these going. Yes, yes. Hopefully, this would be a great problem to have. Maybe by the time this episode airs, they'll already have been introduced. And that would do be... Little, like a little extra intro. So. Yes, that'll be an excellent problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, great. Um, well, thank you to our audience as well for tuning in. We really appreciate you. Stay tuned for our next episode in this mini-series where we'll take some of the dunes... Uh, legislation issues that we've talked about and apply them to the context of Saugatuck, Michigan, mm -hmm. hopefully. Um, and then thank you as well to our sponsors, uh, to our sponsor, Kelsec uh, Incorporated, for making this podcast and our environmental advocacy uh, work possible. So, I'll just listen. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs>